Um, in this session, I have the pleasure to, to host uh, three practitioners from across Europe. They are Gili Karelski from Froting University Berlin, Marie Gilge from Plateau Urbain, uh, which was behind the Le Grand Voisin in Paris, and Maxime Zeid from Communa Belgium. So I don't want to steal the, their time and I will leave the floor uh, immediately to Gili so that she can tell us a bit more about their experience from uh, within the Tegel airport uh, in Berlin. Please, Gilly. Um, hello. Yes, we can hear you. I'm really sorry, but my camera seems to not be working. Um, and just a quick correction, it is not the Tegel airport, it is the Tempelhofer Feld. Uh, the former so, airport in Berlin. No, no problem. Um, I'm here today and thank you for the invitation and the organizing uh, for the entire team. Um, here today to tell you a little bit the kind of context more and the story of how we organize at the Floating University uh, Berlin. Can you see my screen okay? Yes. 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 So um, this. Um, this is the Tempelhofer Feld Airport in Berlin. It's uh, quite a famous um, temporary use example. So I'm not gonna, and most people here maybe know it already. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but I think it is kind of interesting to look at the timeline of this field. It was always a field even before the 20th century uh, in Berlin, but its history in the 20th century has gone through couple of uh, world wars, of course. It was constructed as an airport, as a military airport uh, in the 30s. It was expanded and became a little bit of a forced labor camp uh, during the 40s, the Second World War. After the Second World War and during the Berlin blockades, it was famous for the place where the um, US uh, would drop supplies and food for the residents of Berlin. Um, then it had a short period in the 70s and beginning of 80s when it was closed off until it will and then it resumed flights uh, becoming a commercial airport in the 90s until in 2008 uh, because of the construction of the new airport in the Tegel area it was completely decommissioned it was then closed down completely fenced off from the city it's a huge space in the middle of the city uh, that was not being uh, accessible uh, for many years. The first activist group that came on the site was called Squat Tempelhof, uh, which then later with the reopening of the field as a public park in 2010, transformed into 100% Tempelhof Feld initiative, which meant that this group was uh, trying to fight publicly against the idea to develop this site for housing and different uses. Um, this group was made of uh, several activists and among them also the architecture collective Raumlabor Berlin, um, who then initiated a public referendum that resulted in 2014 with a public decision to not build on the site for 20 years and to have that temporary period as a testing ground for keeping that site open for the residents of Berlin. This is a little map. Um, Ramlebor Berlin were involved with this referendum and a lot of the first initiative um, pioneer activities on the field, prototyping and testing out what possible uses uh, could happen there. And they were researching uh, along the parameter of the field, uh, always noticing this blue dot on top of the field here that was not marked, uh, visible on all the maps, but had no name. So they decided to investigate and go find it. And when they arrived on the site, they found this. This is the rainwater retention basin that is serving the field. You can see in the background the, the antennas from the uh, airfield building. Uh, it collects the rain, the rainwater fall from the field and from the nearby main streets, uh, brings it into this uh, concrete floor basin, and then trickles it slowly back into the canal system of Berlin. First, it goes to the Landwehr Canal, from there to the Spree 
and onwards. Um, this site is eight meters under street level. It's completely surrounded by a colony garden. So it's completely invisible, almost secret. And if you don't know what you're looking for and you don't know how to enter it, you really don't see it ever as a person walking the, the nearby streets of Berlin. Um, it was used a little bit by the colony gardeners around it, but from the construction of the airfield until 2014, it was closed off. And then this site was kind of taken over by nature. The forest ring that you see there that is surrounding the basin from all sides is a naturally occurring um, growth. It wasn't planted. Uh, we're trying to map these trees one by, by one now, um, but it, most of them apparently flew in there, uh, either from nearby trees or um, maybe some of them were planted by some of the gardeners, we don't know, but this is a, a very irregular thing within Berlin where all the trees after the World War II were kind of um, not only planted to revive the, the demolished city, but also uh, recorded and kind of given numbers and given uh, registration. So to find a naturally occurring growth like this in Berlin is actually very natural, very uh, rare. In 2014, as part of different activities taken on as the pioneer program on the field, Ramlabor Berlin were trying to open up this site also for the residents of Berlin. And after four years of lobbying and trying and applying and um, yeah, finding different solutions, the Floating University Berlin in, in, opened in 2018 as an offshore campus for cities in transformation with a massive program that lasted from May until October of 2018. Most of the time it was closed off for collaborations with different academies that brought different seminars on the site, uh, design academies, architecture, scenography, um, different arts, different media studies came on site and engaged in applied research and, and different radical pedagogies on site. And then during that year, uh, throughout three different occasions, there were also open weeks where the site was open to the, pro to the public uh, with different artistic programs. So it was from the beginning, it was kind of imagined as a, as a learning site. Uh, this is some of the architecture that was on site uh, during 2018. You can see here the open platform behind it on the lower floor, you see the bar, then a kitchen that was serving all of the programs. And on the left, you can see the auditorium opening up to the basin. This is a view from another angle. This is actually looking up from the colony garden. And you can see you walk from this entrance, you walk down a scaffolding staircase and you enter into the immatriculation uh, area that is a uh, refurbished architecture from Atelier Bauau that was constructed in Berlin as part of an exhibition, then deconstructed, taken to the Tempelhof Feld refugee camp and serving as a kindergarten class there and then deconstructed again as the camp closed and brought on site where it is still today. Um, and here at the front, you can see our very messy workshop. Uh, Floating University was uh, designed not just for prototyping um, architectures, uh, but also for prototyping all kinds of um, formats of hybridizing this fully functioning urban infrastructure that is still fully functioning to this day. It still retains its original use of receiving the rainfall and trickling it back to the canal system. Um, yeah, and then at the end of 2018, something very nice happened. Uh, we were no longer allowed to use the word university uh, because apparently university is a trademark that requires you to meet certain parameters. And because the educational forms that we were uh, experimenting with on site are not uh, falling under these academic official parameters, 
the city of Berlin, who was uh, funding us through the cultural department, <laughs> was threatening us through the academic department, saying that uh, we must remove the word university from our title. Uh, and this, as you see now, is the solution that we came up with. At the end of 2018, we also decided to form together the float in FL. This is the association that is now running and operating the site. It is a much larger collective than the collective that started it. Um, it includes all kinds of uh, positions, different modes of art, different modes of design, um, chemical engineers, ecosystem management. Um, we have people from all kinds of positions and it's a very intergenerational group from the founding group who are now in their 50s, an interim group who are maybe um, mid-career practitioners, let's say, and a very young uh, group that is still uh, attending the official universities of Berlin. The floating FV is a very fluid, much like the site is very fluid, very fluid organization. Uh, we don't really work with hierarchies, but we work with gravitational fields um, and different organizational models. Uh, we try to keep it very fluid and we try to keep them very open, um, trying to fight this kind of idea of uh, hierarchical organizations uh, as the only mode of being able to build institutions uh, in the city. Um, we had specific themes in 2018 that were water, site, and education. And we started working with more spectral ways of thinking, opening up spectrums rather than trying to fix uh, certain binaries. And from water, we went with our language to viscosity. Uh, and it was interesting before in the morning session to also hear some interest in the way that uh, vocabulary is being used in organizing certain temporary uses. From site, we went to sediments. From education, we went to contamination to kind of really highlight the radical aspect of the pedagogy on site. We have different modes of learning uh, and making and doing on site uh, that inform all of these various working groups that are um, making up the whole association. So the caretaking on the site informs how the design of the site is being reimagined every year. The garden group is talking to the gardeners around us and we try to kind of create an openness there. The program group is um, in charge of bringing internal programs to life, but also inviting external programs for all from the free scene of Berlin in general. Uh, and towards the communication of how we promote our content and how we call out for external uh, involvement and not just visiting on the site. Uh, to the way that we think about how we want to apply for future projects and how we want to build our funding. We're still very much in early days, so the association is still in process of becoming, um, but we are already um, quite well known and integrated into the funding landscape of Berlin, who is, uh, like many other cities, um, reconsidering the way it's looking at cultural funding in public space uh, post Corona, of course. Um, the modes um, of learning on site are all also influenced by how we understand the different aspects of being on site and operating on site, um, mainly going through these three major themes or major areas of consideration. Uh, one being the ecology of the site, which is the starting and end point of everything that we do. Uh, the society on the site, um, which is not just the association and the neighbors, but as we said before, like the entire city of Berlin. Uh, and then of course the cultural programs on the site. Um, oops, yes. 
This is a picture from 2019 as we were forming the association uh, and transforming the architecture on site. We took apart the large architecture and installed a much smaller auditorium pavilion. And 2019 was a very interesting moment to be on a site that is natural, but is not natural at all. Um, that evokes questions of ecology within the city. Um, and that requires a very certain mode of weathering because when you are on site, you are weathering it. It gets flooded when there's rainfall. It is super hot when it's sunny. Um, there's a lot of things eating you <laughs> if you go there at all hours of the day, different bugs, different plants, different animals, different flora and fauna, uh, different algae that is uh, coming through the water and then being dried by the sun and then dying on the site, creating new mud and uh, more res residues. Uh, in 2019, uh, it was also a very interesting moment worldwide to think about the weather, to think about climate. And here is a day um, that the climate movement Extinction Rebellion with their Berlin chapter um, took part in uh, the festival that I co-curate together with Rosario Talevi on site, which is called Climate Care. Climate Care started in 2019 as a platform to um, examine both modes of theory and modes of practice around bringing ethics of care into the, our daily consideration of climate. Uh, and 2019 was a hopeful moment. There was Fire Fridays for Future, Extinction Rebellion, climates uh, made the mainstream media news finally, and it felt like it was a moment when perhaps those considerations are going to come into the center um, of policy making and uh, the public pressure around the idea of uh, mitigating climate change would actually bear some fruit. Um, so it was a really interesting year to think about how this site can become a laboratory for urban ecological questions um, for Berlin, but also uh, beyond. And the forms of testing and experimenting and programming on site and with the site uh, took on four main uh, let's say typologies of knowledge production, and that is the embodied and the applied. So very much coming from embodied experiences of being there, uh, as well as the situated and the site specific. So I said before, everything that we do starts from the site and kind of ends on the site. And so the experience of being there and working on site is quite crucial uh, for Floating University. Then bringing on uh, questions of sustainability, of course, materials of construction become a huge question and the kind of um, leaning more towards natural materials for construction and experiments with what can you do with the biomaterials that are already there, such as the reed or nearby dead trees. Um, and yeah, li just living with the cycles of the site, this is, as you see, a new brand of dead algae on top of the mud. Uh, the pavilion that you see at the background is our iceberg pavilion that was there in 2019 as, and is now long gone. Um, there is a lot of thinking because the site is highly experimental uh, in terms of pre programs. There's a lot of thinking on how to articulate that, how to um, explain it. One of the longer standing programs on the site is the Kinder Uni, ran by Ute Lindenberg and uh, Sabine Tsan. Uh, and they have produced after four years and something like 10 semesters with the same group of kids, uh, the Floating Manifesto. Uh, and I bring it here um, as maybe a less academic way of articulating how we work in site-specific modes. Um, turn your attention to uh, this idea that only when you are here, you are here. Um, 
point number five is probably my favorite, mud, 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 which for us is not just a material that we have to uh, work with and, uh, and bear with every day on site, but also kind of uh, a metaphor for how we want to practice because we are um, keeping the way that we talk about the site always in a very opaque way. Uh, there's many different of us uh, presenting the floating in various contexts, and every time it takes shape, uh, it presents a little bit of a different story. And this opaqueness is also an idea of keeping the site open for different perspectives and not just the perspectives of the members of the association. Here is another time um, is very much correct. Um, Floating University is a green space in the city, but it's not natural. Everything about this site is uh, kind of conflicted and a little bit confusing. Um, and yeah, you enter it in order to enter that mode of thinking. The thinking comes with the doing is very much in the ethos of Floating University. And the doing comes through what is here. So again, we start from the site and we end with the site. Uh, and that is interesting. What is here is interesting. And point number 10 is go. Another point that is at the heart and ethos of how we work on the site. Um, a little bit of an overview of the architectural process, um, the temporary architectures in 2018 by Ramlabor, uh, and then again in 2019 by Ramlabor, but much, um, much smaller and more condensed uh, to allow for a smaller program to emerge on site. And also because um, our existence on the site changes the biodiversity quite a lot. So if before we came on site and started building there, the rainwater would go in the site, circulate it, and then trickle into the canal easily. Now when it meets the architectures that are there temporarily, um, it gives it kind of um, an anchor onto the basin. And so we have residues of mud that are coming in with the water and the algae that grows there. And then um, those become earth for more plants to take root. And slowly the reed um, population on the site is growing and growing. And some of the trees are flying from the forest ring into the middle of the site and taking root as well. And all of this is happening on the cement floor of the basin. Gilly, I will ask you to, to stop here for the moment. Yeah. And maybe we can uh, go back more in details afterwards. Mm -hmm. I know that another intervenant needs to leave us a bit before uh, the end of the session. So I would like to leave uh, some space uh, for intervention too. Okay, just to say uh, that right, just to finish, that mm -hmm. right now we are working towards this new architecture in 2021. Um, it has a new process of participation with the association members behind it, where the basin, the basin floor is more integrated into the design, everything is much lower, and the transfer between the areas um, means that you walk on the basin. And also that for next year, and this is bringing up uh, many questions around temporality and permanence, the owner of the site, the Temple of Priyat Gambaha, are uh, aiming to rewild the basin, which means to move everything aside, including the biodiversity, to change the concrete floor into a more porous one, uh, and then to see what takes root there after this process. And we are now working together with them to see how we can affect this process and what will emerge afterward. Okay, fantastic. Maybe we can dig a little bit also with questions from the public. Mm -hmm. uh, but now maybe if you can stop uh, sharing your screen, yes. I can leave the floor also to Marie Guiguet from Plateau Urbain. Hello. Hello. Hello, Marie. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry. I, I won't be long because I have another meeting and I'm already late, but uh, I'm going to try being really quick. Um, so I'm going to try share my screen.
Okay, can you can you see it? Yes. Okay. So I, I've sent to Laura uh, a link of a video uh, which explains really good the project and uh, presents all the actors. So maybe if you want to dig a bit uh, further, you can watch it. And also we have our website where we can tr we try to uh, make it uh, a bit uh, more com complete complete um, with um, as the project is finished. We are trying to to put all the um, the documentation we had about these five years. So um, for those who don't know the Les Grands Voisins, uh, it's a temporary occupation in a whole hospital uh, during five years. Uh, it was um, uh, the hospital closed due to cost reduction and uh, the owner, the public assistance of Perry Hospital called upon uh, Aurora Association uh, which uh, fights against uh, exclusion uh, through access to housing and to care uh, through uh, professional integration to what we call resident people. Um, so during this first season, as we call it, uh, we occupy uh, 10,000 meters square of, the, of this whole hospital. Um, there were uh, 600 people residents in uh, five different accommodation center and uh, 250 structures um, called as user and they were uh, like uh, associations, startups, artisans, artists and, um, and more. And um, so we were uh, three piloting structures. I was working for Plateau Urbain and I was taking care of this uh, uh, different structures. Aurore was taking care of the accommodation center. And Yes We Camp, uh, which is also an association, um, manage uh, the opening of the site uh, to the public, uh, the artistic direction, the public communication, uh, the visual identity. And uh, we also had um, a cultural uh, programmation, uh, which was uh, free and open to everyone. Uh, so during this first uh, season, there was a temporary occupation convention uh, signed between the APHP and uh, Aurore for the management of the entire site. And uh, after that, uh, during what we called season two, um, we had the arrival of a new actor, which is uh, Paris and Metropole Aménagement. It's the planning authority for the urban development of the project on behalf of the town council of Paris. Um, at this time, a, co a common project is written uh, in 2017 uh, to interrogate the prolongation of the experience uh, while we cohabitate with the works. So at this time, the works of the future eco district already uh, started in a part of the, of the site. Um, and at that time, uh, so we occupy a smaller part of it, and there was uh, 100 people uh, in the uh, accommodation center and 100, 100 structures as users, as I, as I said. And uh, the difference from season one to season two is that we had a common budget uh, to um, to, so we can repart uh, the risk between the three different structures uh, and we could stay. So it was written June in the presentation, but actually we stayed till uh, October, 2020. So in total, we, we stayed for five years uh, where we were supposed to stay at the beginning only for two years. Um, a bit of uh, explanation about the future uh, eco district project um, that who's gonna be there in 2023. So as you can see, uh, this is all the the hospital project. So it's 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 quite huge. Um, it's gonna be uh, so 600 housing. Um, which a program with a program of 50% social housing, 20% intermediary, and 30% accession. Um, 
the the interesting thing is that um, due to the temporary experience, uh, we had quite an influence on the urban project uh, because the promoter decided to implement a center of emergency uh, accommodations thanks to the experience. Um, also, urban planners decided to increase the part of commercial and handcrafted uh, activities on the ground floors uh, in a place where they didn't expect that there was uh, economic attractiveness before uh, in, at that time. Um, they also understood the importance of low rents for commercial and handcrafted, uh, and handcrafted activities in Paris region where prices are too high for small structures or artists to, to develop. Um, and they also imagined a, a mutualized public equipment in a greater way than before occupation. And finally, uh, they decided to experiment new housing uh, property models like uh, CLT, uh, which is public property, which uh, enables uh, social, social accession. Um, we also, due to the temporary uh, occupation, uh, showed that uh, governance uh, between uh, different uh, structures is, uh, is possible and that uh, uh, the mix of um, activities between uh, emergency accommodation, activities and uh, commercial spaces is, uh, is possible. And uh, they also uh, decided to implement principles of a common governance of public spaces and ground floors. So this is quite new. Um, they also built a project house in season two to show to high inhabitants and people uh, to the public uh, what's going to be the future project. Uh, but we we know that uh, it's just the beginning. Uh, it could have been uh, much more if we started the discussion uh, at the really beginning of uh, our temporary occupation. And just a few words about governance because it was quite special uh, at Les Grands Voisins. Um, in this scheme, you can, it's supposed to explain what we used to do there. Uh, so we had um, the three coordinating uh, structures with the uh, Aurore, Plateau Urbain, and Yes, We Pump. Um, we have a collective reunion uh, held every week between all the, the employees of the site. Um, we also created three different committees as a programmation, which, which was open to everyone. If you wanted to create an event or uh, ask, I don't know, create a, a workshop or something with the, with the habitants, uh, you could come to this committee. Uh, the social work um, to explain a bit the practice of uh, social uh, uh, housing and uh, spaces and uh, exterior places, the more technical uh, thing. And um, the, the, the black circle you see there was like small uh, committees that could, can be created by uh, every person who wanted to uh, the, uh, independently. So for example, if you wanted to create a textile uh, circle because you sue or something like that, you could, and you can ask for uh, the programmation committee, for example, to, to organize a workshop, the committee report to the um, uh, piloting structures. And if they say yes or no, or um, sometimes we can give uh, money to the circle so they can uh, organize their events and stuff. Uh, then it was like uh, the decision was uh, going back through the circle and they, they, could, um, they could do their event thing. Um, we had a neighbor council, as we call it, uh, hold every month. We'll, with uh, all the people that work, live uh, on the site. Uh, so a governance meeting is organized previously to define the agenda and discuss about the different decisions that we have to make uh, all together. 
Um, and we also had a, a really strong uh, intern communication as uh, an internal letter. Uh, we use uh, Slack a lot for committees, general information, private messaging service. And we had multiple reports of uh, every reunion. Because uh, so you can imagine when the site was full of everyone, we could be more than uh, 1,000 people every day. So it's quite big. So we really needed to, to share information at the most so people uh, know what's, uh, what's, what's uh, happening every day. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you, Marie. It was a, a quick journey, but a fantastic one. I've been uh, to Le Grand Voisin last, uh, last summer, and it was a really an impressive work. What this you is have a, done. Yeah, this is a photo when we started to um, take everything out when we, yeah. when we left. So we, the, the site was closed to the public in September 2020, and we had one month to... Uh, to pack and to leave everything we built. So it was quite uh, intense, but um, yeah. So, and now um, as a conclusion, yeah, maybe it's interesting for you to know, like we were in mm -hmm. the 14th district of Paris. So it was quite a big temporary occupation. So when it closed, um, pretty much everyone didn't know if we could find another place where after we can go and, um, many new uh, temporary occupation uh, reopen in January of this year. And um, now there is what we call the small Grand Voisin in the, the 16th uh, uh, district of Paris called uh, Les Cinq Toits. So also maybe I will uh, send you um, the website or photos of it so you can, you can see. Uh, and also, uh, since uh, January, we occupy uh, an ancient uh, covent in the 14th district also. And we do the same thing as mixing uh, uh, activities and also housing, and, uh, but we are not open to the public uh, yet. Okay, so can't wait for it. Maybe <laughs> just before, before You're all you welcome, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to come. So before uh, before you go, maybe just a, a very quick uh, comment. Like I know that in Plateau Urban, you, in Plateau Urban, you have a lot of projects going on at the moment, and uh, I was wondering if there's something from Le Grand Voisin that you really bring into other projects, something that uh, you started doing differently mm. thanks to Le Grand Voisin. Um... The thing I would say is governance because it really helped to know uh, the Aurora Association because we are working with them on many different sites at Plateau Urbain. Mm -hmm. So to know how the association works, how people uh, do also social works, I think uh, due to Les Grands Voisins, it's a bit more easier now uh, to when you start a project, for example, at the Covent where I work now, there is also Aurore and uh, Caracol, another association. And uh, we, we use the same tools to like our meetings, uh, reporting things to the community, uh, doing this social committee too, to, to make people know more about uh, what is doing social thing. Um, and maybe also because all the people who worked at Les Grands Voisins, we have this kind of ex experimental uh, uh, wish to continue trying to uh, make things differently. And um, everything goes really quick because when you're uh, in a temporary occupation, sometimes it's just for a year or even like a uh, 15 months or so we have to be in, in the action and doing things really quickly. So. I think for that, Les Grands Voisins was a really good school. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay, fantastic. You really need to leave, huh? because we would have another thousand questions. Yes, but maybe <laughs> I can. I maybe I can come back. It's fun because I am going to a piloting uh, meeting as I just uh, explained you in the governance thing. So I really need to represent Plateau Urbain in this one. Okay. Uh, but maybe uh, if I finish uh, on time, I can come back for questions or stuff like that. Okay, fantastic. 
Thank okay, you thanks so a lot for your time. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye, Marie. Bye bye. Okay, uh, so it was a bit quick, but uh, we had to do with what we what we can. But um, so let's move to to the next speaker, Maxime uh, Maxime Zed from uh, Communa Belgium. So you have been working with, with a lot of different sites uh, in Belgium. So I think that a little bit like Prato Urban, you can bring a, a perspective that has been uh, championed in different places. Can you hear me properly? Yes. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. I'm going to share with you the experience of Comuna in Brussels. I'm going to chat a bit about the STAN network as well which actually involves Yes We Camp that we just talked about in the presentation with Plateau Urbain. I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see if it works. There's always an issue, huh? Wait, give me a second. Yes, should work. Can you yes. see it? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Um, so, is it good? Yes. Perfect. Go ahead, um, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to start with Brussels case and try to put it macro on a European perspective. So you probably all know Brussels and its amazing touristic activities. Um, wait for a second. Um, but Brussels is also full of empty spaces, such as these ones, um, which means up to 30,000 empty houses or apartment. 10% of social housing is actually empty. It's 1.5 million of square meters of empty office spaces and more than 5,000 floors above shops. So it's a total of 6.5 million square meters which are empty in Brussels um, just to give you an idea of what it looks like Brussels is made of 19 municipalities um, and it gives us a, it, it, it's as if we had one entire municipality which was empty so this is just to give you an idea of the the, the immensity of the emptiness in the capital of Europe and it is far from being the only city which is like that uh, Europe is Every major city in Europe is actually built this way. Uh, there are many reasons for which so many places are empty. It can be waiting for a permit. It can be that the owner doesn't have enough money to invest. Um, or it can be simply that uh, we don't know to whom belongs the, the building. Nevertheless, we have so many empty spaces. So of course, this is the topic of the day. Temporary use is a way to transform this vacancy into resources. And this is what Comuna is uh, mainly doing in, in Brussels. So turning these gray, abandoned, dark and boring empty spaces into vibrant uh, building that can be used by a community. Um, so I think and you've probably talked about it the whole day. And I think in the last presentation, we, we saw that temporary use offers opportunities, like endless different types of opportunities of things that we can do with these empty assets. So first of all, we think in Comuna that empty buildings must be turned first into housing solutions. So the example of Le Grand Voisin that has, that has been shot right now in, in, in Paris shows that with empty hospital, you can create houses for many people. But it's also good places to experiment and innovate uh, different models of democracy, of architecture, of education, of, of energy. I think the floating university, which is not a university anymore, of Berlin, um, is also an amazing example of that. Um, and, and of course, hosting different types of events, uh, social entrepreneur, and so on. So to give the picture of what we do and how we function now in, in in Brussels with Comuna, we're now, it's more than, uh, it's more than 50 inhabitants in the different buildings. It's 12 active sites all around the, the city, more than 200 projects which are hosted. Uh, and we're also tightly working with municipalities. Um, basically the idea is to make sure that 
the practice of uh, dealing with empty buildings remain a social practice and that it does not be, uh, become a new way of uberizing space uh, and to run, uh, just as we run the city in general, would run the empty space exactly in the same merchant approach. Um, and I think then I can come back on, on Comuna a bit more later, tell you about how it works in Brussels. But I think it's important to get the European perspective of that. And knowing that in Brussels, we have so many empty places, that in Paris is the same, uh, in Germany is the same, in England is the same, we decided to gather with other platforms of social temporary use all around the world to make sure that we can transform the city and not remain simply experimental project that will add value and then disappear. I think it's a main topic uh, within what we're doing right now is to make sure that we're achieving something that is bigger than simply experimenting on a short term, which I think it's amazing to host people for a few years, to give access to space for cheap for social entrepreneurs. It's already as such, it is a success, but the idea of STUN is to create a European network to go further. So STUN stands for Social Temporary Use Network. Um, and the idea is to, as a platform, we need to improve what we do, become better. We need to become social developers, which is the idea that after using a site for let's say two, three, five years, that we're creating community, that we're adding value, we want to be able to stay ourselves. We want to be able to develop these sites forever ourselves, maybe by becoming owners ourselves of the building that we're right now just running as temporary inoccupant. And the third one is to lobby to change the mindset and the regulation around temporary use in Europe. Uh, knowing the power of the institution, we believe that it is a great idea to work with them to make sure that the regulations are helping to promote the social culture of temporary use around Europe. And so right now the STUN network is built with and by six members. Yes, we camp that we just talked about in France, Comuna in Belgium, Fririga in Latvia, Altum in Germany, Institute for X in Denmark, and Millwall Base in the UK. Um, and the idea, like, th th there are so many now active projects around temporary use, but we thought that if we want to define it as a social activity, um, we need to make it clear that this must be non or limited profit distribution oriented projects. So nonprofits or cooperative most of the times um, that the space must be genuinely affordable for the local community. So the idea is not to extract juice from these buildings by renting them as expensive as we can, but the opposite to make sure that the city becomes affordable for people and that empty buildings must be the resource that we can use for that. And finally, that the space must be co-designed and co-managed by the user. So this is the question of the governments. And I think we're reaching the, the question of the commons and the, the, the common good. Um, how can we manage a resource collectively and make sure that the people who are excluded from the, the city in general can gather around these buildings, find access for their house or for activity, but can also transform their, these buildings as if it were their place and manage them as commoners and not only as users. Um, just to get back at Brussels, to give you very briefly, but like a, an image of a, one of our project as Comuna, uh, it's Le Tripostal. Um, so this is, people who have been in Brussels probably know it. It's right in the, in the south train station of Brussels, La Gare de Midi. Um, this building has been abandoned by the train company about 30 years ago, and it has stayed empty for that entire period of time. The ground floor even burned, uh, and after a collective movement by the neighbors, uh, the municipality decided to force the train company to open it through temporary use. So Comuna joined forces with the neighbors and we managed to get access to the ground floor of that building and to run a collective temporary occupation, which is now going on. Um, I think it's interesting to know that the building was so abundant for 20 years, as I said, 30 years, that it 
burned down, that he had no access to water, to electricity, to gas. So we had to do the entire thing. So I'm just showing you here the little pictures of the collective work with neighbors and volunteers coming to work with the buildings. And we managed to turn it into something where a lot of events are organized. Uh, food bank is happening on daily basis. Uh, there's a bar, events. Well, we hope that now we can finally have all the events that we would like to have. Uh, and many social entrepreneurs using the building. So I will not get deeper into our work, uh, but I think that to me, it's important to try to make sure that the work that we're doing right now, as exciting as it is, uh, we're surfing on a wave of coolness with temporary use somehow. Uh, and I think it's super important to take a moment to look around us and to think in which moment we are relevant, in which sense what we do is profitable on long term, and how we're not transforming our practice or letting our practice getting transformed by big real estate or by the institutions into something that just is part of city marketing or of uberization of the city. And we do strongly believe that by linking different European projects together and by enforcing the fact that the social purpose of temporary use is the most important part of what we do, we can transform the, the way cities are built and lived by the citizens. I think I will end with that. Thank you. Thanks, Maxim. I think you're ready to be president of something. <laughs> really clear presentation and a fantastic uh, values and initiative. Um, I see a question in the chat uh, for you. Uh, it is about how did you deal with regulation and the regulations and licenses for managing such a diversity of temporary uses? Excuse me, can you repeat? Because I, I missed the beginning yeah. of what you how did you deal? How did you deal with the regulations and licenses for a man, managing such a diversity of temporary uses? So, well, you mean that the, every building, so we work with a temporary use contract, which is a sui generis contract that can be changed every time. Uh, the owners 